Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University, where the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today, we want to welcome our uh, fourth lecture, I think, of the 2023-2024 academic year. We're hosting Professor Huang Yong from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And we have a very nice lineup of scholars from different places here to discuss with Professor Huang, including Bobby and maybe Justin Tewald and some other people <laughs> uh, who I'm making fill in. Um, but on the schedule, we have uh, Professor Paul Bloomfield from Connecticut University and Professor Hagab Sirgeson from the Chinese University, oh, sorry, from the City University of New York. We also have Professor Alba Curry from the University of Leeds serving as chair for this lecture. And I want to thank everyone who's been invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible. The topic of Professor Huang Yong's lecture is how can moral expressivism be based on moral realism? The case of Wang Yang Ning. The structure for this event is as follows. Professor Alba Kari will introduce Professor Huang Yong, then Professor Huang Yong will give his talk, and then the two invited commentators will discuss their comments with Professor Huang Yong before we open the floor for comments from the audience. We will end this event promptly at 9.30, at least in this time zone and a couple others, um, which is about 90 minutes from now. Before getting things started and handing things over to Professor Al Bakari, I want to say a few things about the Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes that we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sahai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchanges by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Um, and I think anyone who knows Professor Huang Yong knows that he's, I don't know, a really down to earth, really nice guy. So um, I think a, any conversation you have with him is always exactly in the spirit of Sahai Weishia. So it's really great, Professor Huang Yong, that you agreed to give this talk today. So, um, then before I hand things over to Professor Alba Curry, I'll just briefly introduce her. Professor Curry is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Leeds in the UK. She earned her PhD at the Department of Comparative Literature and Languages at the University of California, Riverside, where she specialized in comparative study of China and Greece. Her previous studies include an MA in Chinese philosophy from Fudan, Shanghai, and a BA in philosophy from the University of Glasgow. Currently, her work defends the positive value of anger in ancient Chinese and Greek ethics, individually and comparatively, and its value to contemporary philosophies of emotions, feminism, and artificial intelligence. Thank you, Professor al uh, Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really a great honor and pleasure. Um, so I will introduce someone who probably doesn't need an introduction, uh, uh, Professor Huang Yong. So Professor Huang Yong is a professor of philosophy at the university, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he has a long and illustrious career. Really, too many publications to pick from, but you know, I'll, I'll say a little bit um, just in case. He received his PhD in philosophy from uh, Fudan University and his doctorate in theology and religious studies from Harvard University. He has taught at uh, Kutztown University of Pennsylvania since 1996, before he moved to Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2013. As you can probably already see, uh, he has interest in both philosophy and religious studies and is familiar with both Western and Chinese traditions. His research focus has been on moral, both ethical and political, 
issues from an interdisciplinary and comparative perspective. Um, Hong has served uh, as the co-chair of the Confucian Tradition Group of American Academy of Religion, among others. Uh, he's the co-chair of the uh, University Seminar on Neo-Confucian Studies at Columbia University and the president of the Association of Chinese Philosophers in, Amer uh, in America uh, from 1999 to 2001. During his tenure, among other things, he has inaugurated a book series, the ACPA series in Chinese and Comparative Philosophy, and the journal Tao, a journal of comparative philosophy. He has also been the chief editor of the latter since the very beginning. Huang is also the founded editor, founding editor and of the first companion series exclusively focused on Chinese philosophy, and you all know it, Tao Companion to Chinese Philosophy, also published by Springer. Um, most recently, he has also launched a book series, Encountering Chinese Philosophy, published by Bloomsbury, and together with Professor Wang Qingjie, a book series in Chinese called Philosophy from Hong Kong, published by Oriental Publishing Center in Shanghai. In addition, if you ever dare look at his CV, uh, he sits on almost 30 editorial boards of his scholarly journals and book series in English and Chinese. And uh, Professor Yonghong, please uh, feel free to start your talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, about for this very uh, nice uh, uh, introduction, and also for uh, uh, Paul, uh, you know, to uh, uh, organize the whole uh, event. I think it's we just mentioned it's very, uh, 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 very good uh, for both uh, uh, scholars and students doing Chinese philosophy. So um, it's a uh, uh, very good opportunity uh, for me to share uh, some of my uh, ideas. Uh, the paper has not been uh, published, uh, although perhaps I cannot uh, revise it <laughs> because uh, uh, this year the, the paper uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually we just mentioned uh, about the uh, encountering Chinese philosophy. So this is a chapter in uh, Simon Blackburn encountered in Chinese philosophy. So he is writing a response to that. So <laughs> if I change it, then he can, he has to change the response. So, uh, but I think it's still good to hear your uh, comments, criticism uh, later when I kind of like uh, do it to like collect in my own books and perhaps I can uh, make a revision. So thank you so much. And it's also good to see uh, many of you, uh, old friends, uh, uh, Justin, uh, uh, Xiu Fu, uh, and uh, you know, of course, uh, Haga, uh, we haven't seen uh, for a long time. Um, so uh, I will start. Maybe I can uh, share the screen. Okay. All right. So uh, since uh, uh, did it, Paul? Did you say uh, how much time do I have? Um, you have as much time basically as you want. Um, just you know, you, I think you should leave time for the two commentators yeah, at least. Yeah, I should think I, yeah, I should not yeah. occupy too much time because my paper is very long, and uh, I already cut short for the you know just to pick up something from my paper. Uh, but it may still take so long. So I think uh, maybe uh, uh to save some time, uh, maybe I just kind of like uh, to uh to read through uh, this uh, slides, I think it saves some time. So uh, this is a paper about moral realism. So moral realism is normally considered to consist of two theses. Uh, one A, uh, moral propositions can be true or false. And one B, uh, at least some of them are true. And two, their truth depends upon moral properties of facts or, or facts that are mind independent in a relative sense. So the, in contrast to, let me see, that's just kind of like my picture blocks of this thing. Uh, okay, I think that's better. So, uh, by affirming 1A, uh, moral realism distinguishes itself from 
moral non-cognitivism, a view that the moral propositions are expressions of emotion in disguise and thus do not have truth value. Uh, in affirming 1B, it distinguishes itself from moral error theory, according to which moral, proposition, moral propositions are describing things that do not exist and thus can never be true. And by affirming two, it distinguishes itself from moral subjectivism, claiming that the truth of propositions is mind, in, uh, mind dependent. So my paper is mostly focused on 1A. Uh, that means uh, whether moral claims have the truth value, right? Uh, okay. Now, uh, for a year, uh, he is famous, usually considered to be uh, a non-cognitivist. That means he denies the truth value of moral claims. For him, the function of the relevant ethical world, uh, ethical world is purely emo emotive. It's used to express feeling certain objections, but not to make any assertion about them. For example, if I say you acted wrongly in stealing that money, the normative term wrongly does not any literal meaning to the sentence you store that money, other than showing that my stating of the sentence is attended by my expression of the feeling of moral disapproval for your action of stealing. In his view, sentences which simply express moral judgments do not say anything. They are purely they are pure expressions of feeling and as such, do not come under the category of truth and falsehood. So neither true nor false, does not have truth value. They are unverifiable for the same reason as a cry of pain or a word of command is unverifiable because they do not express genuine propositions. For a year, if our opponent happens to have undergone a different process of moral conditioning from ours, so that even when he acknowledges all the facts, he still disagrees with us about the moral value of the action under discussion. Then he says, we abandon the attempt to convince him by argument. Although we may feel that our system of values is superior, we cannot bring forward any arguments to show that our system is superior. For our judgment that it is superior is itself a judgment of value and accordingly, outside the scope of argument. So his view is certainly, his view is expressivism and expressivism is a kind of a non-cognitivism and non, uh, it's called anti-realism. Now here I want to turn to Simon Blackburn. Blackburn is also a moral expressivist. He says, in addition to judging the states of affairs the world contains, we may react to them. We form habits. We become committed to patterns of inference. We become affected and form desires, attitudes, and sent sentiments. Such a reaction is spread on the world as Hume puts it in the treatise. So he thinks the value is a thing that we spread on the world. Uh, it's not reflecting things in the world. Entering a moral or evaluative claim would be more like announcing a plan saying, for instance, let's all go to the beach, than like saying something obviously factual, like lions hunt. So Blackburn is also a moral expressivist. Uh, but he denies that he is a non-cognitivist. He claims that his expressivism is a kind of quasi-realist. Uh, this is because for him, even if we adopt the explicit view, which denies all those things implied by this representational conception of knowledge, we can still legitimately claim that we know a number of things, including things in ethics. For example, we know that you ought to be kind to children. We know that pleasure is better than pain. And we know that being rewarded for things that you deserve is better than being rewarded for things you do not deserve. In contrast to representation of an uh, conception, Blackburn calls it a practical account of knowledge or an expressivist account of knowledge, which allows moral knowledge, right? So it's not non-cognitivism because it allows knowledge. 
The question is, then how do we determine, determine the truth of moral claims? And uh, uh, Blackburn basically, I think, you know, I go through his kind of writings, he provided three different kind of criteria. The first criteria is a coherent history. He says, there aren't so many livable, or livable, and fragmented, developed, consistent, or coherent systems of attitudes. So since our value statement is simply expression of our attitudes, but he says not any attitudes will work because you need to be consistent. Some of the attitudes you express there should be consistent with the other attitudes you express, right? So this is a coherent view. And uh, then he also provides the pragmatic kind of a uh, standard. Uh, I will not go much detail into that to save the uh, time. Uh, basically saying that a uh, moral claim is true if it is pragmatically uh, effective, right? And that also has some problem. But I want to say something more about the third possibility. And the third possibility, I, I think is most significant, uh, but somewhat, he went halfway. This is the way to appear to human nature. You know, how do we determine whether our expression of our attitude is true, our moral claim as an expression of our attitude, right? So uh, he, he considers the conception of human nature from David Hume and uh, Smith. So he identifies three elements in David Hume's conception of human nature as the basis of morality. Uh, perhaps I will skip uh, uh, first and a third one, just focus on the second one. He says there is a tincture of humanity in human nature, okay? A sympathy with others that renders the pleasure of others pleasant to us and their pains painful to us. So the kind of uh, uh, empathy. And such a conception of human nature, he says, is also shared by Adam Smith, who conceives the human nature as consisting of a capacity for fellow feeling, for sympathizing with the pain and distress or joy and happiness of other people. So quite similar to David Hume's conception of human nature. So in Blackburn's view, this conception of human nature makes up the foundation of the moral judgments we make about ourselves and others. In other words, now here I kind of like try to expand his view. Uh, in other words, whether the attitudes we or anyone else expresses or projects to things are right or wrong depends upon whether they are consistent with this conception of human nature. Right attitudes are those projected by genuine human beings non-deficient human beings, human beings in whom the human nature, sympathy with others in Hume and a fellow feeling in Smith, such kind of human nature is well manifested. In contrast, the wrong attitudes or false moral claims are those projected by those in whom the human nature is damaged or deficient. Such a person, this is uh, a, uh, a uh, person whose uh, human nature is damaged or deficient. Uh, Blackburn says, such a person is a monster, not a man. So you just leave them alone or if necessary, quarantine him or smother him. It is in this sense that Blackburn detects that in him, despite the notorious passages about the unbridled gap between is and out, there is actually a legitimate transition from is what we are actually like, what's our human nature, to out recommendations about the shape of our practical life should take. Here, since what we are as human beings are actually like is an issue of fact. And a good human being is one who possesses the unique qualities that constitute human nature and makes human beings human. We ought to possess such qualities. So. Blackburn quotes Hume as saying that a sense of morals is a principle inherent in the soul and of the most powerful that enters into the composition. Now, if Blackburn insists on this position, he should have recognized or regarded his metaethical position as a straightforward moral realism, or sometimes he used the term 
view moral realism instead of quasi realism. Since here, there is a clear standard for us to judge whether a particular attitude we, we project or spread on a particular situation is right or wrong. Whether it is one that a good human being would project in these circumstances. And there is a clear standard for us to judge whether a particular human being is a good one or not, whether this particular person has qualities that make human beings human beings, and both uh, what qualities uh, make human beings human, uh, and whether a particular person has such qualities or an empirical matter that can be objectively solved, as Blackburn himself believes Hume and Smith have indeed already solved. Blackburn, however, does not have firm grip on this position and slides back into his quasi-realism, even in the same paper. Uh, this happens when he attempts to explain Smith's view that the manner by which we judge of the propriety or impropriety of the affections of other men is by their con uh, concord or dissonance discern with our own, instead of by their accord or discord with the fellow feeling or sympathy for other as human nature. So here, I want to turn to Wang Yangming uh, as a kind of moral realist. Um, and uh, uh, before I'm saying that, like there are some uh, views uh, claiming that Wang Yangming is, you know, like a traditionally uh, kind of like understood moral realist uh, by, uh, I think the first is by David Nevison and later uh, PJ Ivanhoe uh, also uh, developed this position. Uh, for example, Nevison says that, uh, just as for mentions, for Wang Yangming, there is no effective difference between perceiving a sensible quality with a sense, for example, sight, and perceiving a value quality with the mind. And he further states that when ought to perceive the objective world accurately, including the world of objective value. So he considers the values is out there for us to perceive, right? And this view, I think, is further developed by P.J. Ivanhoe. Uh, he provides a map of various views on the moral status of moral properties and effects. At the anti-realist pole lies John Mackey's position, and at the realist pole lies the position of Wang Yangming and Mencius. Uh, in the middle, of course, he places uh, place some uh, other positions. He argues that Wang Yangming's view, which claims that moral qualities are out there in the world, and available to us through a special faculty of moral sapiens presents the most radical, distinct, and dramatic contrast to Mackey and defines the moral faculty pole. Uh, so they think that moral values are out there and uh, or moral qualities are out there for us to perceive. And I think this view uh, is wrong. I mean, at least when, you know, when they try to interpret Wang Yangming's view. Uh, one place to investigate Wang Yangming's view on the ontological status of moral values is his criticism of Zhu Xi, whether Zhu Xi actually holds the view that he criticized is a different matter, right? Uh, in Wang Yangming's view, Zhu Xi separates the human heart and mind inside us and the moral principles outside, outside us. Wang Yangming says that this is God's view of rightness being external, E, Y which he mentions says has no idea of rightness. Here, Wang Yangming regards the two as holding the same view as Gaozi that mentions criticize. So to understand Wang Yangming's criticism of two and thus to understand one's own view is to see precisely how mentions criticize Gaozi's view. Now I cannot go into detail of uh, mentions criticism of Gaozi, but I want to just make the key point. Although both mentions and Gaozi are moral anti-realist in the sense that they agree that the moral property of benevolence, ren, right, the name, uh, benevolence that resides in us and not in things. So in this sense, they are kind of like anti-realist, right? Because I think moral properties are inside of us, not outside of us. On the issue of the moral property of rightness, God's, you can say, is a moral realist in the common sense claiming that things or people have the properties of to be treated appropriateness in them. Why mention is a moral anti-realist, also in the common sense, 
claiming that we have the property, we, the subject, have the property of treating others appropriateness in us, if we use such kind of term. Now, I discussed Mencius' view, especially in his debate with Gauss uh, in quite detail in my paper, not merely because both Nevison and Ivanhoe have claimed that Wang Yangming is holding the same moral realist view as Mencius regarding moral properties as things out there for us to perceive, but also because Wang Yangming in his argument against Zhu Xi often appeals to Mencius' view in contrast to Gauss' view. Fair or not, he considers Zhu Xi to be holding wrongly a view similar to Gauss, seeking moral, pro moral properties outside us, while defending Mencius' view that these properties are inside us. Wang Yaming criticized Zhu Xi for seeking moral values in external things and considers it to be no different from Gauss' doctrine of rightness as external, EY. So his own view must be the same as Mencius. Rightness and all other moral properties are right inside us, more precisely in our heart and mind. Like a projectivist or explicitist, Wyoming conceives moral properties as a reaction, or morality as a reaction, which is related to his idea of stimulation and the response, Gan Yin. He believes that everyone is born with what he calls a liangzi, which is the substance of a heart mind. When stimulated by external things, our heart mind with such a knowing will naturally make such responses as feelings of commiseration, shame, courtesy, and modesty, and approving and disapproving, and the love between parents and children, rightness between the superior and the inferior, distinction between husband and wife, order between senior and the junior, and the trust among friends. For example, Wang Yaming makes it clear that it is not the case that one perceives the moral property of filiality in one's father immediately upon seeing him, the moral property of to be loved in one's brother upon seeing him, or the moral property of to be commiseratedness in the infant about to fall into well upon seeing it. Rather, it is the father we see that stimulates our heart and mind, which naturally responds with the filiality. So the moral property or moral value of filiality is inside us that we project upon father. It's not an objective property in the father, in, our, in father. Or the same thing about the brother. Uh, we see that it stimulates our heart and mind that naturally responds with brotherly love. And the infant about to fall into will that stimulates of a heart and mind that naturally responds with commiseration. In other words, moral values of filiality, brotherly love, and commiseration do not reside in things that stimulate our heart and mind, but are inherently in our heart and mind, which only needs to be stimulated by the external things. This is why at the end of the sentence that Wang Yangming uh, emphasized that we should not search for them, search for these moral values outside of our heart and mind. Since the response the heart and mind will make upon being stimulated by external things, such as commiseration, filiality, trustworthiness, and benevolence, are all attitudes in Black Burm's sense. We may regard Wang Yangming's metaethics as a kind of non-cognitive. Obviously, it's a kind of expressivism, but whether it is also a non-cognitive. The question is no. Wang Yangming, of course, does not think that his view is a non-cognitive view. And this is already clear in the passage uh, we quoted about, in which he talks about such attitudes. He says, when naturally knows to be filial upon seeing their father, to be fraternal upon seeing brothers, and to be commiserating upon seeing an infant about to fall into a well. Here, not only are those attitudes presented in the form of verbs instead of a noun, to be filial, to be fraternal, and to be commiserating. But these verbs are all preceded by another verb, know, showing that this is a type of knowing, right? So it's not non-cognitivism because he emphasized the kind of knowing. Now, elsewhere, I have characterized this type of knowing as knowing too, the third type of knowing, in addition to what Gilbert Raya calls knowing that and knowing how. What is unique about this type of knowing, knowing too, is that it inclines one to act accordingly. 
For example, I may know that, knowing that, I may know that I ought to love my parents, but still fail to love them. I may know how to love my parents, there's no how, and fail to love them. But I cannot know to love my parents and fail to love them. When you say you know to love your parents, you will love them. The reason that knowing too can incline when to act accordingly is that as a mental state, it's not purely a belief, nor purely a desire, but it is both belief-like and desire-like. This mental state is both belief-like and desire-like. Moreover, it's not just these two different mental states, belief and the desire, lumped together, but it is one single mental state, which from one perspective is belief, but from another perspective is desire. It is belief and desire at the same time, and is thus, to borrow Olsen's term, a desire. For example, my knowing to commiserate upon seeing a child about to fall into a well is a single mental state, which is both cognitive, a belief that the child ought to be saved, and a cognitive, a desire to save the child. Now the question may naturally arise about the possibility of my desires being mistaken. Wyoming makes it clear that our desires can be mistaken. In other words, there are good, true desires, and there are bad, false desires. In the above, we discuss Wang Yaming's view that one's heart mind naturally knows to be filial upon seeing father, to be loving upon seeing brother, and to commiserate upon seeing when, uh, an infant about to fall into a well. This happens, however, Wang emphasized, only when one's liangzi is not blocked by self-intention. And yet, common people inevitably have such blockage, which can be dissolved only through moral cultivation to make the intention sincere. This shows that when stimulated by external things, the heart and mind of different people may have different reactions and spread different values or disvalues upon the things. However, intention, he says, can be authentic, sincere, or artificial, true or false, good or bad. The question is then how to distinguish between intentions or desires that are authentic, true, and good, and intentions or desires that are artificial, false, and bad. And more importantly, whether there is any objective criteria to make such a distinction, as, there is, as this is where the disagreement between moral realists and moral anti-realists arises. In the above, we have shown that for Wang Yaming, the attitudes, the intentions, the desires, that we have upon seeing external things are not their representations, but merely our heart mind's projection upon the external things. We may think that Wang Yaming's answer must be a moral subjectivist, uh, denying that any objective criteria to distinguish between authentic, true, and good intentions and artificial, false, and bad ones. The answer is no. As we have seen, Wang Yaming regards intentions directly issued from Liangzi as authentic, true, and good, and intentions filtered through private desires as artificial, false, and bad. But according to what? Wang Yaming's view is that the former is what good persons, sages, and superior persons will have, while the latter is what bad persons, inferior persons, and common people will have. So the ultimate question, is how we distinguish between good persons and bad persons, and whether the standard to make this distinction is objective or subjective. Before proceeding to discuss Wang Yaming's view here, it's important or helpful here to keep in mind that, as Peter Gigi points out, good and bad, as adjective used here, are attributive adjectives, which are very different from predicative adjective such as red and green. The key difference between these two types of, uh, two types of uh, adjective is that we can understand the meaning of the predicative adjective independent of the things to which it is applied, while we cannot do it with attributive adjective. For example, we can understand the meaning of adjective red 
even though we know nothing about the thing that is read. And so it is a predicative adjective. In contrast, we cannot understand the meaning of the adjective good when we do not know the thing that is good. The reason is that the meaning of red is the same, whether it is a red tree, a red car, a red book, or a red bird. In contrast, in a good tree, a good car, a good book, a good bird, etc., the meaning of good is all different. So in order to know whether something is good, we first need to know what the thing is or what the nature of the thing is. Now to return to our question, how does Wang Yaming distinguish between a good human being and a bad human being? Wang Yaming appears to human nature. The thing that distinguishes human beings from non-human beings and ap approach bearing a strong similarity with the third criteria that Blackburn uses to determine whether our beliefs as expressions of attitudes are true. A good human being is the one in whom the human nature is well manifested, while a bad human being is the one in whom the human nature is damaged. So what is the human nature? According to Wang Yaming, it is nothing but Liangzi, the inborn moral knowing, or literally good knowledge. It is this Liangzi, as we have seen, that responds with commiseration when seeing a child about to fall into a well, with filiality when seeing a father, with brotherly love when seeing a brother. On the one hand, Wang Yaming argues that Liangzi is something that everyone has. Menshe says that everyone has a heart mind of approving and disapproving. Wang Yaming says that this heart mind is the so-called Liangzi. When he says, who does not have this Liangzi? It is something of a heart mind inherently has. Indeed, one claims that Liangzi is the spiritual root planted in us by heaven, Tianzi Liangzi, uh, Tianzi Lingen. And in this sense, he says it is the heavenly principle. On the other hand, Liangzi as a heavenly principle is something that only human beings have. That's for one, as soon as one loses the Liangzi or violates the principle, one is no longer a human being. He complains that there are people in the world who value their body and life too much. They do all things possible to protect their bodies, thus abandoning the heavenly principle. When the heavenly principle is abandoned, they are no longer distinguishable from birds and bees, while living a very long life. It's merely a very long life of a bird and a beast. Now the question is, on what basis does Wang Yaming claim that the Liangzi is a human nature that distinguishes between human beings and non-human beings? For this, Wang Yaming provides two arguments. First, Wang Yaming distinguishes between, like uh, the first argument is uh, distinguish uh, what we can perceive from the things that we cannot perceive. Uh, and he uses two analogies. Uh, he first distinguishes between, uh, makes a distinction between original source, Ben Yuan, and Qi, saying that when Mencius says that human nature is good, and in Wang Yaming that is Liangzi, he is talking about the original source. However, the clue of the goodness of human nature can only be seen from Qi. Without the Qi, one has no way to see the goodness of human nature. What is Qi? He says, the feeling of commiseration, shame and dislike, modesty and compliance, and approving and disapproving are Qi. So this kind of human emotions are the things that we can perceive. And from the human emotions that we can perceive, we can know there are human natures corresponding to them. For example, he says, from the feeling of commiseration that when he expresses or projects upon seeing a child about to fall into a will, we can see Liangzi as human nature. As without Liangzi, there cannot be, there is nowhere the feeling of commiseration can come from. In addition, Wang Yaming also makes a similar distinction between substance and function, qi and yong. He says human nature is a substance of the heart mind, human emotion is a function of the heart mind. However, the substance is subtle and hard to know why the function is apparent and easy to see. So 
in learning, a superior person seeks the substance according to the function. So the point is the same, whether we are talking about Ben Yuan and Qi or Qi and Yong. We cannot know the substance directly, but we can know it indirectly from its function that we can know directly. As it's clear that the substance refers to the same thing as the original source, while the function refers to the same thing as Qi or feeling. A question arises here. Why Liang Zi belongs to human nature, why can't we say that being selfish or selfishness is also at least the constitutive human nature? If so, if this is the case, we are not able to distinguish intentions, feelings, or desires as good or bad, authentic or artificial, sincere or insincere, according to human nature, as in human nature you have both liangzi and selfish desire. Wang Yaming's view is that these desires coming from liangzi are natural, which is already clear in the passage we have quoted a few times. When naturally knows to be filial, right? So it's kind of natural. To be natural in this sense means that such desires are, arise spontaneously, immediately, and without deliberation. That's the one says that from the substance heart of mind, when does things without attachment to them, this is called to be natural. So in contrast, intentions or thoughts that are arranged by selfishness are tangled, confused, laboring, and disturbing. So in one's view, since our feelings, attitudes, or more precisely desire, arising from liangzi are natural, they are genuine and a reflect of our human nature. While our feelings, attitude, attitudes, or desires arising from selfish desires are forced, they are artificial and do not reflect our human nature. So human nature consists of liangzi and not selfishness. It is in this sense that Wang Yaming claims that what I mean by genuine self is nothing but Liang Zi, talking about genuine self. Now the second argument. Uh, so for Wang Yaming, when, when abundance wins heart mind, i.e. when, when the Liang Zi is beclouded with self he desires, when becomes no different from birds and bees. This is, so, however, only in terms of what such people actually feel and do. In reality, however, they are still different. While birds and beasts can never be cultivated and transformed into moral beings, bad human beings can always be cultivated and transformed into moral beings. The very fact that even the most evil persons can, but birds and beasts cannot be transformed into good human beings shows that there is something in human nature that is lacking in the nature of birds and beasts. And this for Wang Yaming must be Liang Zi. Because if birds and beasts also have that, then you can translate birds and beasts into, human, into good human beings, which of course is a counterfactual. So combining these two arguments, Wang Yaming makes the case that human nature consists of Liang Zi, which makes human beings human, and distinguish the humans from non-human beings. A good human being is one whose liangzi shines and is bright, while a bad human being is one whose liangzi is obscured by selfish desire, just as a sun that is blocked by the clouds or a mirror that is covered by dust. With such a conception of human nature, Wang Yaming has a robust and objective criteria to determine whether particular desires spread on the world are true or not, even though both aspects of a desire, belief and desire, have the mind to the word directing of fit. Uh, we talk about the uh, word to the mind directing fit and uh, mind to the word directing fit. That means when the word does not, uh, like a, uh, is not consistent with our mind, we change the world to fit our mind. If they are arising from Liangzi, they are true. If they are arising from selfish desire, they are false. To put it another way, if they are consistent with or corresponding with human nature, they are true. Uh, otherwise, they are false. To put it yet another way, if they are what a good or virtuous person would a characteristic express in circumstances, they are true. Uh, otherwise, they are false. So it should become clear now that Wang Yaming is a moral realist, but when 
who is primarily concerned with the moral properties of goodness and badness of persons rather than rightness or wrongness of action, with a particular value judgment expressing when the desires is true or not depends upon whether it is what a good person would make in circumstances. And whether a person is good or not depends upon whether the person is one in whom the human nature is well functioning or not, which is an entirely objective matter. So, uh, like uh, I just uh, you know, like uh, concludes uh, this whole uh, presentation. Uh, in appearance, Wang Yaming is a moral expressivist. He thinks that the moral claims are true, uh, not because they represent some external reality, uh, but uh, you know, moral statements are merely uh, the expression of our attitudes or our desires, right? So in this sense, he is subjective, but he has a standard. You know, how can we uh, make a distinction between true or good desires and false and bad desires? Basically, we needed to make sure whether this belief, uh, whether this kind of desire is the desire that a good human being, is, a good human being uh, would have, right? And then he provides an objective standard about how do we make a distinction between good human being and a bad human being. So in this case, that is, that I think the title that I used for this talk, his expressivism is based on moral uh, realism. So I should uh, stop here and thank you very much. I will listen uh, to your uh, comments and the criticism. So I think I should uh, stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Huang. Um, so we have our um, first commentator, Paul Bloomfield. I, I think you're here. Yes, there you are. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce you. Thank you very much for coming. Professor Bloomfield uh, is a professor of philosophy at the University of Connecticut Stores. And his areas of spe specialization are moral philosophy, metaphysics, and their overlap, metaethics. Aside from many published journal articles, he is the author of Moral Reality by Oxford University Press, uh, also A Theory of the Good Life, also by Oxford University Press, and the editor of Morality and Self-Interest. He's also the co-editor with David Cobb of the Oxford Handbook of Moral Realism. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh... And thank you, Yong, for such a terrific talk. Uh, it's very rich. Um, I haven't uh, prepared a set of comments in particular. Uh, I guess I was under the impression that my time would be uh, uh, used in a discussion with Yong of what he says. And so I kind of just have some questions and thoughts that uh, I'd like to hear how he would respond to them. Um, in general, I think the paper is, is very rich and subtle and, and actually kind of difficult. Uh, for me, of course, it was uh, 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 harder because I don't have the Chinese to understand the text that you're working with. And even in English, uh, I think a lot of these discussions end up being extremely slippery when it comes to trying to distinguish projection from detection or realism from uh, expressivism. And, and I think that this can be seen by comparing how Blackburn used to be, used to call himself a projectivist um, uh, back in the 80s uh, and was happy to kind of compare moral properties with secondary qualities and thought of himself as a non-realist or an anti-realist or a quasi-realist is what he became. Well, on the other hand, there were people like McDowell and Wiggins who were also appealing to colors as an analogy for moral properties, and yet they called themselves realists. So it, it, it was sort of hard for me to have any uh, uh, I just have to trust Yu Yong in, in, in uh, the interpretation of Wang to see how these things were going to go. Uh, and, and of course, Blackburn is, is an extremely slippery philosopher. Uh, 
He kind of wants to have his cake and eat it too. And if you and, and it seems as if he's dancing on a kind of razor's edge. And if you push him on one way, he bends the other way. And if you push him that way, he kind of bends the other way. And, and uh, it's kind of hard to nail him down. I remember once I asked him uh, if the fact value distinction was a factual distinction or an evaluative distinction. And he kind of went humana, 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 he'd rather not say. I mean, so, so in detecting uh, uh, the sort of status, the ontological status of projected properties, I think that that's a challenge. Um, uh, uh, I, I wasn't sure, Yong, exactly how the expressivism of Wang is supposed to uh, be related to the realism. Um, I got that the realism is based on a pretty thick conception of human nature. Um, and, and yet uh, uh, it wasn't clear to me how that's related to the sorts of moral properties that you think that these good people are projecting onto the world. In other words, uh, not all brothers are deserving of brotherly love, right? Mm -hmm. So that even from someone who has a good uh, human nature. Um, and so when you see a brother that is deserving of love, then the good person will react with love. But if you see a brother who is not deserving of love, it seems like the good person will not act in, in, with brotherly love to that particular brother. So it seems like the, the, the reactions of the good person are going to be based on the, the actual properties of whatever the good person is reacting to. Um, and that didn't sound so much like expressivism to me anymore. Um, so, so uh, 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 I guess I was uh, uh, not really, I wasn't really clear how the expressivism was related to the realism. And let me say one more thing before I ask you to uh, comment. I'm familiar with some meta-ethical theories. Uh, Joel Kupperman has written about this stuff. Uh, David Kopp more recently. Uh, uh, oh, and there's some other. Uh, oh, oh, and Dorit Baran. All are, uh, uh, accept an expressivist, understanding of moral language and yet are open to this expressivist understanding of language being consistent with moral realism or there being facts about what's good and bad and right and wrong. Um, that seems slightly different than the picture that you've given us for Wong where mm -hmm. the expressivism isn't just about the moral language but is literally about the properties that are uh, somehow being projected. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. And, and if there's time, I would be, uh, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this thick notion of human nature that you see in Wang. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, should I, uh, should I just respond now or? Okay. Yes, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor uh, Broomfield. I think uh, it's good for us to see uh, face to face, right? <laughs> Not in person, face to face, but in the past we just <laughs> email each other. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, you know, for this uh, uh, very good question. So like, uh, yeah, you know, Brooke, uh, the Black Woman is a, a very difficult person to read. I think uh, um, it took me more time to write this paper than many other papers because I read it soon, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, his uh, uh, writing is uh, uh, not easy to grasp indeed. Uh, but at the end, I think, uh, I, I joked with him. I said, no, I understand you better than you understand yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, like, you know, first of all, I think he is uh, different from uh, uh, McDowell and uh, Wiggins. Uh, he does not hold this view, uh, at least no longer, uh, the view that the uh, moral properties are like uh, secondary qualities. Um, so he, he is a, uh, uh, his position, I, I think, basically still the same, but his term, you know, most of, kind of prefer is to use the expressivism. He used it to be called it like a projectivism, and what is the other term he also uses? 
uh, but he likes expressivism. Um, so he thinks that like uh, moral claims, uh, just like uh, Ayer says, it's merely expression of attitude. But then he says that we can still uh, you know, use the term truth or false, because if you merely expression of attitude, then you cannot say moral claim is true or false, but we can still say it. And uh, so the question is, uh, uh, you know, how do you determine? Because he says whether it's true, not because it represents some kind of objective, say, moral facts or moral property, uh, but then what, right? So he used different kind of standards. Like uh, I think in my paper, I mentioned several ones. When is uh, you know kind of coherent theory? Uh, another one is pragmatist theory. But the most, uh, from my point of view, uh, most promising one is appealing to human nature. And uh, here, I think uh, it's related to uh, your question about how Wang Yami makes uh, you know uh, uh, his expressivism as a kind of moral realism. Uh, so I, I think you know over the, that conception, like he talks about conception of human nature in David Hume and uh, Adam Smith. Uh, I think it is quite similar, uh, not exactly the same, to Wyoming's conception of human nature, right? So uh, what he is trying to say, uh, if we expand his view, is that the moral claims made by people uh, whose human nature is uh, is fully manifested, then such kind of moral claim is true. And, uh, or, you know, you can say, because not only moral claim, but it's expressing of value. Or the value projected by those people are, you know, true values, but the values projected by, suppose, some people whose human nature is impaled, right? Because like he used his concept, like, you know, he basically used David Hume and Adam Smith talking about sympathy or empathy, right? So if a human beings uh, uh, no longer has sympathy, empathy, and then the value projected by those people, they are false. And I think uh, uh, Wyoming is holding a similar view, although you know much more clearly. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, I think uh, like uh, Blackburn didn't kind of like uh, see the whole picture of that. If he see that, as I mentioned, he should not regard himself as a quasi realist, but as a he sometimes use real realist. <laughs> so it's a kind of realist. Now, I think one thing is, uh, uh, I need to say something is, uh, like in a different paper, uh, I talked about like different kinds of moral realism. Uh, traditionally, when we talk about moral realism, uh, they focus on the moral properties of rightness and wrongness of action. Uh, because this is mostly like a consequentialism, uh, deontology. They are focused on the rightness or wrongness of action, right? Uh, and the type of, of moral realism that I'm developing from Wang Yaming uh, is concerned about the goodness and the badness of person, agent, right? So in this, you know, it's more kind of like a virtual ethics approach to moral realism. Uh, uh, or you can say, uh, you know, common discussion of moral realism uh, is based on or discussion of the issue uh, involved in deontology and consequentialism. But the type of moral realism uh, or metaethics that I'm talking about in Wang Yaming uh, is more related to the issue arising from virtual ethics. So just like in the normative theory in virtual ethics, the right action is action that a virtuous person would characteristic do. So in metaethics, a moral claim is true only if this is a claim that a good person would characteristically make. Now the question is, how do we make a distinction between good person or bad person? Right. So moral realism in this case is about the real about the objectivity of goodness and badness, right? And so uh, here that's why we appear. To and I think uh, like uh, uh, Blackburn and uh, uh, Wang Yaming more clearly uh, appear to human nature. A good human being is a being whose human nature is fully manifested, and a bad human being is a human being whose human nature is impaired. Right, and so a uh, a moral claim is true if it is a claim that a uh, good person 
what a characteristic make in such kind of particular situation. So, uh, so that's why kind of expressivism uh, by itself is kind of like anti-realism. But since it has some criteria about what kind of expressions are true, what expressions are false, then it is a kind of moral realism. But it's moral realism about the moral properties of goodness and badness of person, not the rightness and the wrongness of action. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that the, no, 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 that, 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 that's helpful. Um, I, I guess uh, uh, um, I can see how the account of rightness uh, is in a way kind of piggybacking on the account of goodness. And the, the realism is stemming from the account of goodness. Uh, I guess there's a hard boiled card carrying moral realist. It sounds odd for me to hear realism expressed in a way that says that an action is right because a good person reacts in a certain, uh, because the good person does it. Rather, you think that the good person does it because the action is right. And that seems more like the traditional realist way of understanding it. Um, so that, that when, when, the, uh, when the good person reacts with brotherly love to the loving brother and does not react to the uh, non-loving brother with brotherly love, that, that those reactions are not uh, the, 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 the correctness or the, the normative value of those actions is not dependent upon the, the quality of the judger, but is dependent on the qualities of that which is being judged. Um, so I, I, I do, uh, uh, but uh, there I'm just reporting the way I normally hear yeah. things and think about things and I appreciate yeah. that you're presenting a different kind of picture here and it's a very interesting one. Um, I'm not sure that I would call it expressivist but that's just about the names because when I hear expressivism I think of something else. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think that's all too terribly important. Maybe uh, uh, we can switch to uh, human nature a little bit. Uh, I forgot how much time I have here, Alba, could you sort of fill me in? You have you have time for that. Um, I think you're like okay. three or four minutes okay. to talk about uh, human nature. Yeah, yeah that, that, that'd be great. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, I think that Blackburn's appeal to human nature is uh, uh, one of these places where he's kind of leaning in a direction that he resists in other places. As you say, even in the same paper, he kind of there's the place where he says it and there's the place where he kind of takes it back. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I mean, so in, in general, I think that it's going to be hard to get clarity on these things by comparing uh, what we're trying to get clear on with what Simon says. I mean, don't get me wrong. Simon is an old friend and I have huge respect for Simon, but, but he's, he's kind of hard to pin down on some of these uh, uh, pointed ontological issues. Um, so uh, as far as how uh, Wang uses human nature, uh, I guess uh, uh, personally I, I am more in agreement with someone like Aristotle who says that humans aren't born either virtuous or vicious, but with the capacities for both. And mm -hmm. how we end up is determined by kind of how we're raised and who we are. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and regardless of the sort of sympathy that we would like to find in human nature, I think that it's a deep fact about humans that we have a very strong tendency to make us, them distinctions so that we have sympathy towards us and we mm -hmm. lack sympathy towards people who are them. And I, I'm not quite sure how that kind of picture would mesh with what you were talking about with Wang. Uh, the other question that I would like to hear uh, 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 more about um, concerns uh, how Wang sees bad people as 
non-human in some way. I mean, the way that the way that it sounded in your paper was that, you know, bad humans are like birds and beasts and they're not even human anymore. But but that's using a normatively loaded sense of human where only good humans are humans. But of course, mm-hmm. bad humans are humans too. And same same with the word nature there. There's there's a sort of descriptive sense of nature where everything in the natural world is nature. But then there's this other sense where where you would say, I don't know, some disease is not natural because that's not how things ought to be. And that makes it sound as if there's a normative sense of natural that's at play as well. Um, So I was hoping you could say more about how Wong views uh, 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 bad people and what kind of status they have. Uh, oh, one last thing. It does seem to me that some people are beyond hope and beyond the ability to be redeemed. And so the, the very strong claim that we can turn anyone from a bad person through education into a good person, I think that that's kind of psychologically unrealistic. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, all the uh, good questions, yeah. So now, of course, first of all, we talk about you know talk about a human nature, uh, not necessarily say like the idea of a nature. So human nature, we are particularly referring to the things uh, or the thing that makes human beings different from non-human beings, right? So now they, you might have different conceptions of human nature, uh, but I think Wang Yaming's conception of human nature is not fundamentally different from David Hume's conception and uh, Adam Smith's conception. You know, when they talk about uh, uh, like sympathy, when they talk about the fellow feeling, right? Uh, they are they are quite similar, right? So perhaps both of them, uh, you know, they are all different from Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle perhaps would not say like that the thing makes human beings different from other beings. Uh, he would perhaps say rationality is, right? Uh, now, the, the question, uh, I, I think like, you know, one uh, question that people usually ask is like saying that, uh, you know, Wang Yaming is simply make some assertion, say this is human nature, right? And uh, the question is, you know, <laughs> why do you say this is human nature? You know, like what kind of reason you have to do that? So uh, in a uh, different paper, uh, actually different paper, like uh, uh, Paul, you just mentioned uh, like, uh, David Cobb uh, actually is one of the uh, commentators uh, on this paper of mine. Um, uh, he also raised some uh, good questions. Uh, but the, uh, in any case, the, the, the point I'm trying to uh, make here is talking about this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the idea uh, of uh, human nature, the nature that is a bit different from other things. How do we know that? And uh, uh, I would characterize it as some kind of like a um, inference to the best explanation. So he essentially tries to try to explain some kind of empirical facts that uh, perhaps we all agree upon. One thing uh, is the thing uh, that uh, uh, Paul, you just mentioned, uh, you know, like uh, about uh, bad human beings and the birds and beasts, right? So he says that, of course, like, uh, you know, when they are really bad human beings, they act like bees and bats, birds and bees. But he says they are still different. And why? Because he says bad human beings can be transformed into good human beings, but birds and bees cannot. So that's why he says there must be something in bad human beings that birds and bees do not have. And this thing, he says, is the human nature, right? <laughs> Uh, and so he says there must be something there. So we don't know what is the thing. But the fact is that bad human beings can be transformed. Uh, let, let me just uh, uh, put off the other question. You say, no, maybe some people just cannot be transformed into good human being, right? Let's, I will say uh, this later. But uh, let's just say, you know, bad human beings can be transformed into good human beings, but the animal and the beast cannot. And he says, this shows that there is something in human being that the, the animal does not have. So we need to explain it. So, and he says, this must be something like, uh, you know, the answer, right? Uh, another thing is, uh, he is also- Professor Huang, I'm just yeah. gonna stop you here and maybe you can pick that up uh, a little bit later, um, just so okay. that we can have time for 
uh, okay. Hagop to ask his questions, if you don't mind. Sorry for rushing. Okay, you. okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So let me very briefly then uh, thank uh, Paul and uh, briefly introduce um, uh, Hagop Sarkisian. I hope my Spanish doesn't mess up your name. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so he's a professor and chair of philosophy at the City University of New York, Barrack College, and professor of philosophy at uh, Kearney Graduate Center. His research is located at the intersection of moral psychology, metaethics, and classical Chinese philosophy, especially Confucianism. He has authored or co-authored papers in these areas for several journals, including Philosophical Studies, Philosopher's Imprint, Philosophy East and West, Tao, Annual Review of Psychology, Mind and Language, British Journal of the History of Philosophy, and History of Philosophy Quarterly, as well as numerous anthologies. He is co-editor with Jennifer Cole Wright of Advances in Experimental Moral Psychology and with Philip uh, Ivanhoe, Owen Flanagan, Victoria Harrison, and Eric Schutzgabel, The Oneness Hypothesis. His work has also been translated into Chinese and Korean. Uh, thank you very much for being here and uh, agreeing to um, give uh, Professor Wang some questions. And I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Um, no, it's a real pleasure. I was actually um, uh, wanted to, young to complete a slot previously, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, things that I think are are, are related to some of Paul's questions. Um, so, Paul mentioned this shift in 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 Blackburn's thinking about uh, the nature of morality where he went from this more kind of projectivist view to this kind of quasi-realist view. And it seems like that's partly motivated by this distinctive feature of like methodology in metaethics, where, uh, you know, part of what we're supposed to be doing as, as proper metaethicists is somehow uh, vindicating ordinary moral practice. Uh, that's, that's kind of like an input to our theories that if our ordinary moral practice uh, seems to commit us to the existence of objective moral facts, then whatever meta-ethical theory we construct should be able to explain uh, or incorporate this datum into, into our theories. So it seems like, you know, this is a, uh, kind of like a core datum that pushes around uh, the debate. So de depending where you land uh, in your meta-ethical theory, that can either be something good for your theory, because like, let's say you're a realist or you're an objectivist, then it's a it's a feather in your cap that like ordinary people seem to be like objectivist and relativist. So in that sense, there's like this coherence between your theory, right? And then what ordinary practice seems to be. So it seems like that's sort of one thing that's pushing Blackburn into this realist kind of view from the more expressivist origins of that view is, you know, uh, when when faced with objections, right, you could do one of two things. You can say, no, that's not true. Or like, oh, yeah, I'm already committed to that in some way. And thank you. I can develop my theory. And then he develops his theory in a way to try to accommodate this. So. So what I found interesting in your paper, uh, Young, was that so you came up with these three different ways in which to cash out the realist element right in 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 blackburn there's the there's the coherentist dimension of it right mm -hmm. and then there's the uh, pragmatist kind of and then there's the human nature and mm -hmm. you know as someone who has you know done work in ethics i mean that aspect of blackburn's thought was not at all salient to me so i found this very uh, illuminating in your presentation and you know, if I, you know, maybe maybe you do know his theory better than he does at this point. Um, so you were making this judgment though that out of these three, the one he should focus on is human nature. Yeah. So 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 that's sort of like your own thing. Like he, he uses these three things. Yeah. So my my questions about about this about like focusing on human nature as a way to like distinguish what is like you know really moral from like what is not. Because I, this is the aspect actually of, of like Wang Yangming's thought that I've always found to be like the most problematic and where like I feel like I just have to kind of depart ways from him. 
So, um, so, so, so let me finish my thought and then I'll try to form it into a precise question, but I'm trying to walk you there as I'm trying to walk myself to like what my question is, because as Paul said, this was a really rich talk. Okay. So, so it seems to me, and I think I owe this thought originally to a paper by Fang Youming many, many years ago called the three dogmas of new Confucianism or something like that. So it seems to me that like, from the perspective of someone like Wang Youngming, there's like this, you know, privileged access that some few people can have to human nature. So human nature is not something that um, each of us equally has access to. Like human nature can reveal itself uh, in certain sort of spontaneous moments. This idea goes back to Mencius. So the idea is that, that you know, our true natures kind of come out in our behavior. But then there's this thing about like, but how do we, you know, we have all sorts of reactions to the world. And, you know, Paul brought up this idea that, you know, not all people that we might feel compassion for, like deserve compassion or like our proper ta targets of compassion. And like, so, so as part of our like moral experience, we have lots of sort of different kinds of reactions. And then if you, if you were to ask someone like Wang Yangming, and I'd like your input, Young, about like, okay, so how do we know? How do we know which one of these um, movements of what we assume is human nature is actually correct because Wang is, I believe, committed to the view that no, 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 not all of these are correct, right? It's only the ones that are like pure of selfish desires. And you're like, okay, Wang, how do we know which ones are free of these selfish desires? And then the answer to that question, I believe, is like, well, you undergo this extremely long process of meditation and reflection and this kind of training. And that training allows you to get clarity on the parts of your human nature that are like really the authentic, which, what is liangzhi? And then like, what is not liangzhi? Like what is like a, an occluded or clouded or, you know, unclear manifestation of this, right? So, so you know, I think echoing something that Paul said in his questions, like normally, like, you know, you would think of a realist view as pointing to things out there in the world as being the moral properties, but here we're looking inside. And then while I can appreciate that that's like a criterion of delimiting what's moral, human nature, like you can point to it and say, oh, like that's my answer to the question of where the properties lie. It seems to me it's beset by this deep epistemological problem, which is like, how could we know and then, so out of the three criteria that you presented from Blackbird, to me, the other two like are somewhat more promising here, like as, as criteria that we can actually, you know, have a conversation about or this idea of coherence or this idea of pragmatism. Like these are things that we can discuss and, you know, but, but it seems like that discussion is just fraught when we take Liangzhi to be the thing Right. If, if we're stuck in a conversation about what's a true expression of Liangzhi and what's not, it's just like this deeply subjectivist thing about like the nature of your experience. And then whether that nature is true or not seems to me like an, a very fraught kind of exercise. So I guess my question is like, um, what do you have to say about all of that? And uh, um, and and and. Um, and, uh, you know, could you say more about why you believe this human nature element is the more promising out of the three criteria that you distill out of Blackbird? Okay, very good. Uh, uh, thank you. So, uh, so actually that's a question continues from uh, uh, Paul's uh, question uh, about uh, human nature. Maybe first of all thing, uh, I think uh, I want to uh, like mention that, uh, you know, like uh, this idea of human nature uh, is, uh, uh, inevitable in any kind of, or not any, uh, like uh, most kind of, uh, you know, uh, versions of virtue ethics, right? Because uh, virtue ethics is supposed to be mostly concerned about the goodness and the badness of the person, in contrast to deontology and consequentialism, uh, which are more concerned about the rightness and kind of wrongness of action. And so if you want to determine you know, whether a person is good or bad. And just think of, like I just very briefly mentioned, you know, Peter Gitch's conception of good or bad as attributive term. You can never determine, know uh, the meaning of good unless you know the thing that is said to be good, right? It's supposed to, uh, you say the good acts, but you don't know what acts is. You have no idea 
what the good means, right? Uh, suppose, you know, kind of like, a, uh, it's a good X, good, of course, yes, you know, a kind to people. But if you say good, this, if this X is a tiger, then the good X, you know, should be, you know, like to eat human beings, right? If the, the, the tiger doesn't want to eat a human being, it's not no longer <laughs> good, uh, uh, good tiger, right? So, I mean, the, the, so that means goodness is, must be related to the nature of the thing that is said to be good. So when we say good human beings, we have to know the nature of human beings. Now you have different conception of human nature, right? Aristotle has one, like, you know, I think uh, uh, this is neo Aristotelian, I like her work, uh, Rosalind Hurst House. Um, she also developed some, you know, very different from Aristotle, although still along the same line as Aristotle, you know, conception of human nature. Because without knowing what is the nature of human being, you have no way to say whether this human, this particular person, Peter or someone is a good human being or bad human being, right? Now the question is whether Wang Yaming's conception of human nature is, is kind of like, a, uh, is merely assertion or not. And this is like, a, you know, I just finished up my uh, response to polls, like a, uh, a question, you know, the same, similar question. Uh, I say, you know, Wang Yaming's kind of argument about human nature is essentially the like a uh, inference to the best explanation. That means he wants to in explain certain kind of facts, particularly these two facts. One fact I already mentioned that is, you know, bad human beings can be transformed, can be cultivated into good human beings, right? But animals can't. So how do we explain this difference between bad human beings and uh, like animals, even though he sometimes thinks that bad human beings act like you know animals, but uh, still different, right? See, so how do you explain that? He says there must be something in human nature that makes bad human beings you know possible to become good human, but cannot you know like uh, the the animals do not have that. And you can call it whatever you want. Why I mean call it liangzi, you can call it something else, as long as you can explain the fact that bad human beings can be transformed into good human beings, but animal can't. So this is one basic fact he wants to explain. The second effect is explain, uh, he wants to explain, and that is a classical one. Uh, almost all neo-Confucian uh, want to use that. That is you know, the, the classical example uh, of mentions. When you see a child about to fall into well, everybody has this kind of feeling of commiseration. This feeling of commiseration, this emotion, that is kind of empirical, right? You can experience. So you have to explain why all human beings have that. There must be something in human nature that make it possible for human beings to have such kind of feeling when they see a child about to fall into well. Now, why I mean call it liangzi? You can call it something else, as long as you can say that explains why human beings can, you know, have such kind of feeling. So in this sense, it's not as kind of like speculative or subjective as we thought. We may still disagree with his conception of human nature, uh, but he does have some kind of like, a, you know, arguments for that. But this argument is not deductive argument, not inductive argument, but it's kind of inference to the best explanation. Uh, you need to explain some common facts that we have, right? Uh, so you provide, you know, Wyoming provides this explanation uh, someone else may provide other explanation, or someone say simply deny the fact. Say no, that's not a fact. <laughs> These are all the ways to argue against it, right? Yeah. So, can I just a quick follow up, and then I don't want to yeah. take any more time. But you well, know, so I was so thinking, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, I was say we have just two minutes, so we won't have any time for questions from the audience. So absolutely, okay. Then, uh, then, then I feel free to finish then, your then thought will. and will. Okay. My um, my thought will remain unfinished. I want to hear what other people have to say. Well, we, we won't have time, so you should finish your thought. That's what we should do. That's the best use of the time. <laughs> I see. Okay. So so I'm going to try to state it slightly differently. So suppose you have a view that uh, is different from Wong's. It says the properties are out there in the world and that we have some special faculty that can detect those those properties, right? One problem for any kind of such view is, is trying to explain like, you know, which... How do we tell, right, wh wh whose faculty is working correctly? How do we know 
that um, you know I'm uh, I'm detecting these properties correctly, right? That's like an epistemological criteria, like problem, right? So it's not a problem of sort of like identifying or coming up with an account for where the property is, right? Or but but it's more a problem of if that were true, then like how come we're beset by all these problems about disagreement and how come we can't, you know? And then to me, so Wang kind of shifts this thing from outside to inside. But then mm. if you ask this question, like, but we all disagree, like we, we can't, we have different moral views and some of us seem good, some of us seem bad, right? And then you ask, so so how is it we can know Wang? And then it seems like, what, what I'm curious about is like, does he have a better answer there? Because to me, it just seems like the answer is, you know that at the end of this long process of self-cultivation, and so it's it's so so even so it's it's closer to me, it's in me, but then like my access to that thing seems just as much kind of problematic. Um and so that that yeah. that, that was that was the nature of my question. I was going to say I'm going to be the cruelest chair you've probably ever had because I have to uh say thank you to you all. And hopefully this means you can continue your conversation at another time. And I hope that the audience, thank you so much for being here. I'm sorry that uh, we didn't get to your questions, but hopefully, yeah, we can continue this at another time. I'll leave you with a cliffhanger. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, especially uh, Paul and uh, Helga for your uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, we wish you have uh, more time to have a discussion uh, about the, you know, very interesting uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, also helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Okay, yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>